We are on our last week of our study that we've been going through called Letters to the Church. And I've, I've wanted to look at this in the way that if, if one of the apostles or if Jesus was writing a letter, what would it say to us today? What would Jesus want Fredericksburg Church of Christ to know? But I think what would Jesus want the church as a whole to know? And so as we come again to our last week of the study, we're going to be talking about the church, or church again, making the church what the church is supposed to be, a church led by God, a church not led by man. Before we start off, I want to say thank you for the birthday song. I was trying to avoid that. Gary, Gary yelled at me this morning for not putting my own birth date on the calendar. So if you notice, the calendars are printed and my birthday is not on there. Um, if you've noticed on the office door, the door into the nursery that leads into my office, Jackie gave me a birthday present and put the, the word unity up on the door. So now we have shalom from last year and unity for, for this year. So I was thinking about that the last couple of weeks, and I was like, I really want to get that done. And then I walk out there this morning, and there it is. So it was like Jackie read my mind. Um, so I'll have Jackie come up, and she'll do the, the sermon then this morning. <laughs> No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I don't want to put anybody on the spot or anything. So we'll ask three questions this morning, specifically about the church. And is the church structured in scripture, or is the church structured in tradition? And for some people, that may, may hit a little bit of a nerve. But are we structured in scripture, or are we structured in tradition? And I know I've hit on that throughout the last couple of weeks. What distracts us from God? What keeps us from God? What keeps us from a relationship with God? And the last question, which I think we all need to deal with on a regular basis, on a daily basis, every time we wake up in the morning, are we too comfortable with our Christianity? Are we too comfortable with our Christianity? Which ties back in kind of really to the whole series and and question here this morning. But really, if we look at it, we're going to answer this first question. Is the church structured in scripture or in tradition? And I pulled up this, found this document, this, not this morning, I found it earlier this week because I used it to help prepare this message. Does anybody know what this, this is? Can anybody see what it is? Might be, it's our, it's our bylaws. It is the bylaws of the Fredericksburg Church of Christ. Basically, this document states everything that the church stands for, what the church does, how the church should do it, and anything in between that. We're going to go to the second article this morning, and we're going to talk about the purpose statement of the church, which is purpose statement or, or mission statement. Notice I skipped the first article because that states the name of the church and what the na- church name should be. If you don't know the name of the church, talk to me afterwards. I'll help you figure out where you're at. But anyway, I want to go through this purpose statement this morning. And this is what it says directly from the bylaws. The purpose of this corporation shall be to lead sinners to an obedient belief in Jesus Christ, to exalt Christ, to exalt God through Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God, and the Bible as the Word of God, to build a church without denominational name, man written creeds, or other barriers to Christian unity, to provide opportunity for worship and fellowship after the New Testament pattern, which includes the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper and thereby restores primitive Christianity and consequent union of all followers of Jesus Christ with the Bible as the only final authority. Now you'll notice there's two words in there that I really, really like. There's, let me go back to one there. Notice what that ends. That removes any barriers to Christian unity. And restores primitive Christianity as a consequent union of all followers of Jesus Christ. Unity and union is written into what our mission statement is, what our purpose as a church is. Maybe I should have pulled this out a little bit while ago and and used it for that sermon. But now we're going to go through and break this down. This is what the church is to do. To lead sinners, sinners, not seniors, well, I guess seniors too, but but sinners to an obedient belief in Jesus Christ. Who here is a sinner? 
good. We have 100% participation this morning. And even the phone said <laughs> two. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. <laughs> we talked this morning in Sunday school. When do we go to a doctor? When we're sick. When should we go to a church? When we sin. So I'm glad this morning that we are all here and all have the mind enough to tell that we are all sinners. This is what the church is designed for. And because of that, we are to exalt God through Jesus Christ. Hopefully all of us here this morning, most of us took communion saying that we believe in Jesus Christ. And because we believe in Jesus Christ, then therefore we have to believe in the one who created Jesus Christ. We have to believe in God. And we know we believe in Jesus, and we know we believe in God, all because of what Scripture says. Because we believe in the Bible as the Word of God. To build a church without denominational name. Now we are our Fredericksburg Church of Christ. And you may notice other churches of Christ throughout this area. That doesn't mean we are all this doesn't mean that we're not all joined together and we don't share in, in some unity and some friendship and some, some different aspects of fellowship. And that doesn't mean that we don't join with the other churches in the area for the sunrise service coming up in a couple weeks that you should all be at at 6.45 a.m. But what that does mean is we don't have a governing body. We don't have a pope and we don't have bishops and we don't have apostles and we don't have all of this other stuff that we have to dictate what leads us, which I think is really nice because the only person that I'm in question to is the elders, and the only person that the elders are in question to is God. It makes things a lot simpler for us when all we have to deal with is questioning God. I don't think that's actually simple at all. I think that's actually a lot harder now that I say that out loud. Our church is dedicated to God not to some governing body, not to some president of some organization. Nothing comes between us and God. And that's the beautiful thing about this. There are no creeds or any other barriers to Christian unity. Basically, we've taken anything out that keeps us from God. Anything that may complicate things between us and God. We don't have to do a penance. We don't have to do confession. We don't have to do all of these other numerous things in order to come to God. Why? Because there is nothing between us and God. To provide opportunity for worship and fellowship after the New Testament pattern, which includes weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. We opened in prayer. We sang. Well, most of us sang. And then we participate in the Lord's Supper. That's what we do every week, and that's why we do this every week. And thereby restores primitive Christianity and consequent union of all believers. What does that mean? Primitive. I like that that word's in there, that it's primitive. It takes it back to the very original church. It takes it back to the very root of the church. And when we look at it, that's the only thing we should be worried about, is keeping it that simple. And actually, we'll get into this a little bit further. And we do all of this because of Jesus Christ, because the authority of the Bible tells us. Now, I know you read that paragraph, and actually, if you look at that paragraph in the bylaws, that is one sentence. It's a really long sentence. All of those words to say, we exist to be a place were people with questions, seeking answers through Jesus who came from the Father as told through us by Scripture, which is God's holy word and final authority in our lives. All of that, I can break it down even further. We're all sinners seeking Jesus through God's creation that we learned through Scripture. That's what we exist to do. That's our purpose. That's why Fredericksburg Church of Christ exists as Fredericksburg Church of Christ. Anything beyond that doesn't matter. Now, if we're talking about church structure, and that is our, our purpose statement, our, 
the things we do on Sunday morning, are those reflective of those statements I just read this morning? Is what we do on a Sunday morning reflective of the purpose that we set out for? And I hope we can say yes to that. Because if a church structure, a church of what they do on Sunday morning does not reflect their mission statement, then they're no good, they're no better than the heretics. They're no better than the people outside the walls who claim no belief in God. Because they set up a purpose that they do not fulfill. They say one thing that they want to do, and then they do something else with their actions, with their service. And so this purpose statement, this mission, is what we seek to do. Now, regardless of of personal conviction of should there be anything else added, should there be anything else taken away, no. Because when it's broken down, it says that we are all sinners who are following Jesus to the best of our ability, who is the only son from the creator of all things. And we know all of this through the Holy Bible. That's the basis of our, of our mission statement. And anything beyond that is... ...in the Creator, and we believe in the Bible. And the Bible tells us about everything else that we may need. And so that brings us to... There we go. Brings us to Acts 2.42, which we talked about that primitive beginning church. And what Acts 2.42 says is all believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching or to scripture. It's a fellowship. Well, we were all here. We were all sharing before service. We all share after service. And in sharing in meals, which next week we will share in meals, and including the Lord's Supper, which we partook in, and to prayer. We prayed this morning. I'll pray again later. And then before we all leave, I'll pray once more. That is prayer. This is the primitive church. Notice it doesn't say anything about a projector. It doesn't say anything about a screen. It doesn't say anything about TVs or or lights or... What would happen, I wonder, if one Sunday we came in and there were no TVs on? Maybe the lights weren't even on. Maybe you walk in and you didn't even think church was, was open this morning. But yet all we did was sit here and simply talked about this. Would that be enough? Would that be enough for, for you for a church service? And if the answer is no, well, then maybe I have some more, more work to do this morning. That brings us to our, our second option, our second question this morning. What, what keeps us from God? What keeps us from a relationship with God? And oftentimes we, we get... We're humans, right? We like to complicate things. Does anybody complicate anything? Does anybody overthink anything? Does anybody think that, you know, they like doing things their way better than other people's way? And because we're human, we complicate things. But if we look at what Christianity is, oftentimes we call it a religion. Or it's often phrased as a religion. And then religion gets a really bad rap or a really bad tone and people don't like religion because it seems to tell us of what we can't do. It tells us, no, we can't do that. No, we can't do this. No, we we shouldn't do that. But it's more than that. Christianity is more than just religion. It's relationship. Let me say that again. Christianity is more than religion. It's relationship. Do you know God? Do you know God? And I'm not talking about just reading through Scripture and knowing God or coming to terms with God. Because if we try to develop a relationship just based on Scripture alone, it's like seeing that that teacher in the summer at the grocery store. Do you remember when you were a little kid and you saw your teacher outside the classroom and how weird that was? Like, that person exists outside of school? I thought they lived there. There's just always that weird feeling. Like, or you see that face at the store and you're like, I know that person, but I don't know where I know that person. Like you can recognize the face. You can recognize who they are, but you don't know them. 
And that's what we've boiled Christianity down to, is we take it at face value, we take it at what we learn on Sunday mornings, and that's all God is to us anymore. We've left it at simply knowing God. But do we have a relationship with God? Do we allow control in our understanding to go to God? Hopefully what you've realized I'm getting at is our prayer life is just as important as our life with Scripture. And if you've noticed, anytime Jesus comes to a big point in, in his ministry, he, he goes and prays. Jesus himself goes and prays. You know, we, we always end prayer in Jesus' name. What did Jesus say at the end of his prayers? Did he end with, in my name? Jesus, who was and is God, still had to pray because he was still human. I hope you understand how important I'm getting at as, as prayer is. And let's take a look at, at one of the times Jesus prayed. If we look at the story of, of Mark chapter 6, verses 45 and 46, right before this, Jesus and his disciples just fed the 5,000 with the, with the schoolboy's lunch. With the two loaves of bread and the fish, they fed 5,000 people. After the disciples questioning what was happening, of how they were going to feed it, of how they were going to pay for this, Jesus answered all those questions by simply saying, it'll work. And so it says here, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. While he sent the people home, after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Now I can't imagine how tired Jesus was. Because this wasn't just, you know, an hour service that we have. This was Jesus preaching for an entire morning of talking to all these people gathered for an entire day. I'm not just talking about, oh, maybe it was three, four hours. No, this was a thing that started at sunrise and went until the sun set. They were there for so long that they missed lunch, and then Jesus realized that these people were going to be hungry, and so they would have needed something to eat. And this is where the lunch of bread and fish came in. And what did Jesus do directly after that? Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples go. I hope you read this as he kind of disciplined the disciples. As the disciples' lack of faith, he told them to go. Get away from me. I need some time to myself. It's kind of like before the door, girls could, could open doorknobs, I would, I would shut the door behind me and kind of hide in the bathroom every now and then. It was just because I needed some time to myself. I was tired of asking the question of why. Luckily, Harper's out of that stage now, but I think every kid goes to that stage of why, 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 why. And sadly, you get that parent answer because I said so, which is the most frustrating answer to, to I think, any kid. Why can't I do that? Because I said so. Just because you've run out of any other answer, it's just because I said so. I think Jesus is kind of at this point of, because I said so, get back in that boat and leave me alone. I'll finish up, I'll clean up everything, I'll say goodbye to all the people. And then after all the work was done, Jesus didn't go and join his disciples. He didn't go and continue preaching. He didn't go and continue teaching. He went up into the hills by himself to pray. He went into isolation to pray. Away from all distractions away from anything that could take him away from God, he isolated himself. This morning at Sunday school, we actually talked about this, this concept um, that I've kind of tried to take on, this kind of meditation type thing of, of being content in your boredom. Being content in your boredom. And it's this interesting concept of, oh, well, there's nothing to do, or I'm going someplace and I won't have anything to do, so maybe I'll take a book. Or maybe I'll take something else to read. Or maybe I'll take some little game to play with. But no, it's not that. It's isolating yourself from even that. Now, when, when Crystal was in college, there was a, I graduated, and then a year later, Crystal would graduate. And so I would, I would take these trips with Krista where I would, I would drive her to her tests to get her teaching license and stuff. And if you know anything about those tests and those licensing things, those things take 
hours. And so there was times where I'd sit in the car for five, six hours, but I wouldn't take a book. I would even shut my phone off and I would sit there with nothing and allow myself to go through that, that boredom. Because let's, let's face it, when, when, human, when humankind, when humankind came into the picture, what, what did they have? What were they designed to do? If we look at Adam and Eve when they were kicked out of heaven, they, their only thoughts were, how do we survive? How do we make it to the next day? Where do we find our next meal? That was the only thing they were worried about. That was the only thing they had to take up their time, was surviving. And now we wake up in the morning trying to pick from six different cereal boxes. Luckily, we're just in Fredericksburg, so we only have the cafe, the bakery, the Blue Moon Bistro. Oh, we're only 20 minutes from everything in Worcester. What do we pick? We don't have that need for survival anymore, and we have all these different options. In fact, we have all these different options that how many times have a, has a husband asked their wife, where do you want to go eat? And she says, I don't know. And then the husband says, what about this place? And then the wife says, no. That's a totally different story. I won't get into that this morning. I don't want to get myself into too much trouble. But we have so overwhelmed ourselves with choices that we've lost the ability to choose. But what happens if we strip everything away? Give ourselves no choices. What if we're forced to be still? That's the exact opposite, it seems, that humans, humans are wired today. We're not wired to just be still. We're wired to be doing something. We're wired to produce something. It's kind of like that shark mentality. If a shark stops swimming, it will, it will die. If a shark stops moving forward, it will die. Even as it's sleeping, it will continue to swim. It kind of goes into an autopilot type thing. And I think we've all kind of developed that. I mean, my grandpa had retired, I think, like three different times because he's one of those who just constantly has to be doing something. And I think a lot of us are that way. That we think if we stop doing a job, then we might, we might die if we stop doing. And this, is a, this was a study mainly, mainly for kids about them stripping everything away and forcing them to focus on, on what's going on inside their head, about what they're feeling. And there's times in the office where I feel like I should just be constantly doing something, that maybe I'm starting a new sermon series and, and I should be writing something, or I should, be, I should be learning something, or I should be studying something, or I should be, I feel bad that I haven't learned biblical Hebrew. I, I don't know why, but sometimes I feel bad that I haven't learned biblical Hebrew that I should be doing something. But it's the times where I'm doing that where I feel like I haven't gotten anywhere. It's that time where you feel like you're just going in circles and nothing's getting accomplished. It's kind of like that two steps ahead, three steps back mentality. Of I've gotten three things done, but I feel like I haven't gotten anything done. And it's those times where you take a step back and you allow yourself to go through that time of nothingness of that time of being still and then that's when it seems things take off boredom forces imagination boredom forces creativity boredom forces you to refocus and reevaluate what you're going through in life and as humans we've lost that ability we've lost the ability to sit and to be still and yet that is exactly what God wants from us. If we look here into Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, notice what it says here. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, this is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away, your, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples and speaking to those around him about how to pray. 
Now, if this isn't a verse about street preachers and how that doesn't work at all, I don't know what other verse will speak to that. But it says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Isolate yourself from everything, from anything that distracts you, anything that pulls you away from God, get rid of it. And then pray to God. Now, I just read from two different verses where if we look at the the verse in Mark, it says that Jesus went to the hills to pray, away from the town, away from all the people. Now, I'm sure after that message he delivered, after speaking to those people for so long, they had questions. And some of them probably tried to follow him. So I can imagine Jesus just walking higher and higher up into the mountains till it got so cold that the people just walked back home. And then in this, this verse, he says to go away, to go by yourself. But Jesus does this multiple times. It's mentioned in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 46, Luke chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, Luke chapter 9, verse 18, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. All of those references I just mentioned are times when Jesus went away by himself to pray. That's just Jesus going away by himself to pray. And those were just the ones that I could find. There's so many other times or so many other instances of Jesus going away by himself to reflect, to dwell on his relationship with God. Boredom is a good thing, and I think the term boredom kind of gets a bad name. It's not boredom, it's being still and understanding why we were created. Refocusing on why we exist. Refocusing on who we are, but more importantly, focusing on who created us and whose we are. And the last question this morning, are we too comfortable with our Christianity? Are we too comfortable with our Christianity. As a Christian in America, we have it pretty easy. Okay, we don't have it pretty easy. We have it really easy. Now, I've mentioned this over and over again, that if you were to describe yourself, if someone was to ask you who you are, what would be the first five things you said? Now, if you think about those five things in your head, why isn't the very first one Christian? Why isn't the very first one Christian? And I know Rick, when he goes to, to Jordan, Momi mentioned it when she was here, when she delivered her, her message, that on their IDs, it has a section for religion. It has a section that says Muslim or Christian. Because it's not just what they believe, it's who they are. And I think that's the most beautiful thing. And a couple weeks ago, we went over this list of of top 10 most dangerous places to be a Christian. And we compared that to the list of top 10 places that Christianity is rising the greatest. And those lists matched up pretty 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 well. Why is that? Because they're not comfortable with their Christianity. Their Christianity forces them to be uncomfortable. We sit in our boredom, but then our boredom pushes us. It pushes us to do things that we couldn't think possible because of God. Because God allows those things that we think are impossible to become not impossible. Now, some of you may know where I'm going this morning, and I almost, almost read from, from Revelation chapter 3, what is it here? Revelation chapter 3, there we go, verse 15. I almost read from that one, which if 
most of you know that verse without even really knowing that verse, if that makes sense. It's the verse about being lukewarm. Because you're neither hot nor cold, because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Hot water is good for cleaning and disinfecting and really good on a cold day like this to make a cup of tea or some coffee or hot chocolate if you are more prone to that. Hot water is good. Cold water is good. You ever come in from a hot day outside and and there's cold water? I don't know if there's anything that tastes better after mowing the lawn for a couple hours and you come inside and drink a cold water. I don't know if it mixes with the sweat in your mouth or something that just makes the water actually have a taste, but... But have you ever had a drink that sits for a little while? And it's been there, and you're not sure how long it's been, so you just walk by it, and you drink it, and then you realize... Ew. That's what that lukewarm is. It's not good for for cold. It's not good for replenishing. It's not good for healing because cold's good for, for healing too. But it's not good for disinfecting or cleaning or, or keeping warm. It's just there. It just exists. Now I was going to read that verse. I think I pretty much did. But what I am going to read this morning It's from Revelation 3, verses 1 through 3. I know all the things you do, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you do not wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as unexpected as a thief. If we look at the context of this verse, this is the angels telling John what to write to the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis had a good reputation of being alive on the outside. It looked good. It had programs. It had a thriving youth ministry. It had events. It had Bible studies. It had all the things that you could dream of in a church. But what does it say about the people? You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Just because the things are there doesn't mean the people are there. And we come in on our Sunday mornings with our our warm coats and our jackets and and we carry in our Bibles that we carry on Sundays and then we don't see them again for the rest of the week. That sometimes they look really good behind a little display glass case. Like that Bible me and Krista got for our wedding. I mean, granted, things like 50 pounds, so it's impossible to carry around anyway. Or it looks really good on our nightstand. You know, maybe, maybe if I, we put our Bible on our nightstand and, and maybe if I don't make it through this morning, they'll see that the Bible was there and they'll see that I was a good person. But you're dead. It may look good on the outside, but on the inside, what does it say? That's a hard thing to, to deal with this morning. That, yeah, we're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing. We're checking off all the boxes. I prayed today. I read the Bible today. I talked to this person about God. But where's your heart? Does your heart match your actions? Or have you grown so content that you've simply started with the motions? Because I know for a lot of us, we're simply playing church. We're simply just showing up on a Sunday. And when I first started into ministry, it was kind of drilled into you when you first start ministry that, that it's about the numbers. Ministers have this hard time between the numbers game and the spiritual game. Between, oh, how many people are in attendance? How, much, how many numbers are you bringing in? 
What's your offering like? How much, how much money are you bringing in? Are you bringing in more than you're spending? And I struggled with that because realistically, that's what ministry kind of, we need numbers to survive. If you look later in the bylaws, the church doesn't take any money, doesn't work off of any money from any governing body. Not from any government, not from any, any outside organization. It comes from you who are here. It comes from the generosity of you. That's what keeps the lights on. That's what keeps this place running. That's what gives us enough to make it through each day to the next meal is because of you here and your faithfulness and your giving. We don't need any more than that. We come to our annual meetings and we've got an abundance. We're trying to give money away and trying to figure out how to give money away. We're in a good spot as far as that goes and we should be because we've been faithful. That, that rings true, small in number, but large in faith. We see it again and again with this church. And for that, I'm, I'm thankful. And we are blessed in that aspect. But that's another checkbox. Are we simply checking off a list? Or are we living in a relationship? Do we come here simply because that's what we're supposed to do on a Sunday morning, or do we come here earnestly seeking God? Earnestly living for God. Earnestly wondering what God says to us about what he wants us to do. Because there's something that's not mentioned in the purpose statement, but is mentioned through scripture, and so, yes, that is mentioned in our purpose statement, that each and every one of us has a gift has a purpose, has some kind of ability to further God's kingdom. Are we using it? Are we using it for God? Because if we're not, then we're using it selfishly for our own gain. And in that case, once again, we are dead. It says, wake up and strengthen what little part of the church is not dead. And what that means is stripping everything away. Stripping everything down to the bare necessities. And I think that's what God had in mind in part with COVID. That COVID was bad. We'll all admit it. That COVID was a nasty thing. And COVID wasn't good for, for anyone. And it forced churches to close their doors. It forced us to, Rick mentioned the, how communion was before. We've stripped down everything. We've had to go back to the bare minimums of how a church is run. For Chum's churches, they've gone back. They're back to 100%. They're back to what they were doing. My prayer is that we never get back to that. That we stay at the bare minimum. Because if we don't have the bare minimum, if we start adding things, then we might distract ourselves. The things might become more important than the thing they were designed for. Sometimes I, f I feel bad about the, the men's group starting off and then kind of falling off. But last time I checked, I'm not the only man here. I know that the women's group is in, is in good hands. But once again, Chris is not the only woman here. The women who are part of the women's group aren't the only women here. The women who lead whenever the church needs a meal aren't the only women here. Jack isn't the only one here who can sing. Jeff's not the only one here who can press a button in the back and change it to the next slide. And... All right, that was bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's not the only one who can well okay Greg might be the only one who can work that back there it's a bad example but we all have a part to play and if we're not playing that part then we might as well be dead that's where we're at this morning 
We need to make the church the church again. Not just this building, but the people. I know that's harsh, and we'll have Ann come back up, and we'll move into our time of invitation this morning. And I want you to focus on these questions this morning that I asked. What is keeping us from relationship with God? What is distracting us? And the other question. That's the main question I want to focus on. What's keeping us from relationship? Because honestly, that'll solve all of the problems. Our spiritual health is more important than our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health. Because if our spiritual health is where it's at, or where it should be, everything else will take care of itself. I firmly believe in that. If we look at all the issues in the world, if we look at all the issues on our prayer list, if our spiritual life is where it's at, or is where it should be, everything else will correct itself. Everything else will go back to where it's supposed to be. So let's focus on that this morning. Let's focus on that spiritual life as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you sometimes that that harsh words or words that sit uncomfortably in the stomach are, are exactly what we need to hear. Lord, we don't go to a doctor when we feel good. And Lord, we come to a church when we are sinners. Lord, we openly admit that we are sinners this morning, but we seek you. And we turn to you to dwell on who you are and who you mean to us, what you mean to us. Lord, we thank you that you are the creator of all things and that you chose to create us. That despite our sin, despite our flaws, despite who we seemingly are, you chose to change that through your son. You chose me above all things so that I may live a life that glorifies you. Be with us this morning and search our hearts. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.